I do. Sir, are you Justin Ross Harris? Yes, sir. Mr. Harris, do you understand your charges on 145669, charging with cruelty to child second degree and felony murder on the 18th day of June this year at 2955 Acres Mill Road at Anacott County, Georgia? All right, you may proceed. Who's going to Mr. Boring? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. You may proceed, sir. Thank you. Detective Stoddard, would you please introduce yourself to the judge by uh, telling your names and spell it so the court reporter gets it correct. Yes, sir. Um, Detective Phil Stoddard, S-T-O-D-D-A-R-D. -D and Detective Stoddard, where do you work? I work for the Cobb County Police Department um, with the Crimes Against Persons Unit. How long have you worked in that unit? I've worked in that unit since December. Kind of self-explanatory, but what type of cases do you investigate? Crimes Against Persons investigates, of course, in crimes against persons um, committed in two persons, um, ag assault, kidnappings, rapes, and homicides. Now, uh, before you became a detective with Crimes Against Persons, what was your job? I was with Crimes Against Children's Unit. And what types of crimes did you investigate there? We investigated mostly sexual assaults, um, any type of assault or crime that's committed to a child. And did that include physical uh, abuse and neglect of a child? Yes, it did. So you've been trained and had experience in homicide and child abuse investigation? Yes, I have. Okay. Just preliminarily in this case, um, what was the date of the incident in this case? It was Wednesday, June 18th. Okay. And all of the incidents you're going to talk about here today, did they all occur in Cobb County? Yes, they did. And in this case, what was the victim's name? The victim's name was Cooper Harris. And how old was he at the time of death? I'm 20, approximately 22 months. Um, have you spoken with the medical examiner about this case? I have. What is the cause of death in this case? The cause of death in this case is going to be hyperthermia. And what is the manner of death? It was listed as a homicide. All right, Detective, I'm going to ask you some questions basically about the timeline of the day and the basic facts that I don't believe are in dispute. Um, could you tell the judge, first of all, um, what time did the uh, child wake up and who is his father? The child woke, the family woke, you know, around 6.30 in the morning. Um, the child's father is Justin Ross Harris. Um, you see Mr. Harris here in the courtroom? Yes, I do. Mr. Harris is sitting at the defendant's table to my left wearing an orange Cobb County jumpsuit. Now, who was the first person to wake up? First person to wake up that morning was Justin's wife, um, Leanna. And what time did she wake up? She woke up around 6.30 in the morning. What time did uh, Cooper, the child, and the defendant wake up or actually get out of bed? They got out of bed, it'll be after eight o'clock after seven o'clock. Where did uh, Leanna, the mother of the child, go that day? Leanna left um, for work about seven fifteen that morning. And what did the defendant and Cooper do that morning? That morning they sat in bed, um, he watched some cartoons, um, then they got up and got dressed and Justin um, drove them to work. Now when they drove, did they stop anywhere before uh, getting to the defendant's work? Yes, they did. Where did they stop? They stopped at the Chick-fil-A, located on Paces Ferry at Cumberland Parkway. Now, this morning, uh, in speaking with both the defendant and the mother of this child, was there anything out of the ordinary that morning? Nothing. How was the child doing? The child's doing great. Okay. Did the child have any medical conditions or anything that affected his uh, abilities to walk, talk, or anything of that nature? No. Everyone has said the child was normal that morning. Um, no medications, no medical conditions, um, nothing of note. When the defendant and his wife uh, worked, did they both work? They both worked. Okay. Where did the defendant work? The defendant worked at the Home Depot. 
And which office uh, with Home Depot did he work at? He worked at the place that's called the Tree House. It's at 2600 Cumberland. It's kind of annex of the store support center. What, where was Cooper taking care of while the defendant and his wife were at work? It's called Little Apron Academy. Um, it's a daycare. It's connected to um, the store support center, which is on Paces Ferry Road. Now, whose responsibility was it usually to take the child to the daycare? Normally, Justin would take him to the daycare. Okay. So the defendant would be the normal person to take him? Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So taking him to daycare that day would not have been out of the routine? Not at all. When he takes the child in his car, what type of car did the defendant drive? He had a 2011 Hyundai Tucson. And can you describe that to the judge, what type of car it is? It's a four-door SUV, but it's a small SUV. And what type of car seat did the child, was the child restrained in? Um, Cooper was in <clears throat> that morning, and most of the mornings, Cooper was in a rear-facing child seat. And that rear-facing child seat, was that behind the passenger side, behind the driver's side, or in the middle of the back seat? It was in the middle of the back seat. How far or how close, what was the distance between the driver's seat <coughs> approximately and the head area end of the car seat? Um, six inches at the most. Now, you said that the defendant and the child stopped at Chick-fil-A. They did. Was that out of the ordinary, or is that something that they did uh, on special occasion? And no. Um, Justin stated that this happens two or three times a month, um, and they, you know, it was a daddy-son time. It was a special occasion for them. About what time did they get to Chick-fil-A? Around 9 o'clock. And did you confirm that through uh, the defendant or other means? Um, both. Um, the defendant stated that, you know, they went to Chick-fil-A first, and I was able to pull cash register receipts from the Chick-fil-A and surveillance video. Okay. And on the surveillance that. video, I'm sorry to interrupt you, mm -hmm. on the surveillance video at Chick-fil-A, um, how did the child appear? The child appeared wide awake and happy. Per the defendant and uh, the video, did he appear to be walking around and active at that time at the Chick-fil-A? Yes. After leaving Chick-fil-A, about what time did they leave the, the Chick-fil-A? About 9.19. And where did they go from the Chick-fil-A? From the Chick-fil-A, um, they drove right to um, Justin's work, 2600 Cumberland. What is the distance from the Chick-fil-A to his place of work? It's approximately 0.6 miles. So it's not even a mile? Not even a mile. Now when the defendant um, is there a, a stoplight where he ends up having to make a decision about whether to turn to go to uh, the daycare or go to work? There is. Okay. And about how far from the Chick-fil-A is that stoplight? Uh, a tenth of a mile, two tenths of a mile. And how would you get to that stoplight coming from the Chick-fil-A? <clears throat> coming from the Chick-fil-A, you make an immediate right-hand turn. Um, you then take a U-turn in front of the Home Depot and immediately move over to the left-hand lane um, to take a left turn on a Paces Ferry. What time did the, uh, did you confirm what time the defendant arrived at work? I park? did. And what time was that? Around 9.25. And how did you confirm that? We confirmed it through the timestamp on surveillance video for that parking lot. What time did the defendant leave work that day? The defendant left work that day at, um, it would be 4.15, 4.16 p.m. And from talking with witnesses, uh, both at Home Depot and the defendant, did you determine where he was going after he left work that day? After he left work that day, um, he was going to meet up with a couple of his friends and go see a movie. What time was the movie that they were going to see? A five o'clock movie. Do you remember what the movie was? <laughs> 22 Jump Street. Did the defendant actually make it to the movie theater? He did not. How far is it from the workplace where he left at 4.15, 4.16 that afternoon to the place where his car eventually stopped? Oh, less than two miles. And how far would the movie theater been uh, from the place where he stopped? Uh, not far, a um, couple minutes at the most. When the defendant arrived or pulled over from the evidence that you have, um, what did he do? 
When the fence pulled over and it was at the Acres Mill, he pulled it directly into um, a shopping center, um, Acres Mill Shopping Center, and parked his car in the middle of the roadway. Um, he exited his vehicle and popped open the rear door to his vehicle. Um, he entered into the rear door, um, removed Cooper from the car seat, removed Cooper from the car seat and then placed him on the pavement um, next to the vehicle. Um, he got down next to Cooper. Let me ask you this. Mm -hmm. um, what was confirmed from the uh, law enforcement and witnesses on scene, uh, what was the condition of Cooper uh, when he was pulled out of that car and placed on the, the pavement? And Cooper was deceased. Now, in this case, detective, did you actually get a timeline and did you interview the defendant? I did. Have you, other, you and other detectives interviewed several other witnesses and pulled a, a great deal of evidence. In this That's case. correct. Okay, I'm going to talk to you a little bit first about the defendant's, uh, the reports of his behavior at the scene of the crime, mm -hmm. okay? Or the scene of where they pulled the car over. Um, what type of establishment is this? You said it was a little business area? It's like a strip mall. Okay. And what was the, the, the stores or area that he pulled into near? He pulled in near next to like a restaurant. Did you, or did another officer speak with the first person to come into contact with the defendant? Yes. Okay, and what was his name, if you remember? Um, Anthony Polanimo. Based on his description and other descriptions uh, of other witnesses, how did the defendant appear and how did he act when he pulled over and got out of the car? The witnesses and everyone described that he pulled into a high rate of speed and they heard squealing tires when the vehicle came to a stop. Um, Justin immediately exited the vehicle. Um, he seemed upset. Mm -hmm. um, his behavior was considered erratic um, by many of the witnesses. Um, he would be yelling and screaming, oh my God, what have I done? My child is dead. And then he would stop and he would just have a blank look on his face and just stand there. Um, when he pulled Cooper out of the vehicle, he placed him down the, on the hot pavement. When he did that, did anyone assist him in getting the child out to the pavement? Yes, Anthony did. When they did that, how did Anthony describe the defendant's behavior when they put the child on the pavement? When they put the child on the pavement, um, he said it, it looked like Justin was messing around. He, he didn't know what Justin was doing. And he's like, he goes, we, we need to do CPR. We need to do something for the child. Mm -hmm. um, Justin kind of looked at him, and then he just stopped. Um, what, did miss, what did Anthony do? Anthony started CPR. When Anthony started CPR on the defendant's son, what did the defendant do? When Anthony started, um, the defendant stood up. Uh, walked to the other side of the vehicle and got on his phone. When the defendant, after he separated himself from the child and got on the phone, um, did he appear to be, per the witnesses, talking on the phone? Yes. Uh, did you talk to officers who actually encountered him? Yes, I did. What did they say he was doing on the phone? He stated he was telling somebody on the phone that his child had died. Now, when you spoke with the defendant, what did he say about actually speaking to somebody on the phone? He stated he had um, not gotten anybody on the phone. Um, have you reviewed preliminarily uh, his phone logs? I have. What did those reflect? They reflected three phone calls. What was the first? First phone call was to Leanna. Um, it looked like it was a missed phone call. Um, the second phone call was to the Home Depot Corporate Center, um, their main number. Um, and there was a third phone number, um, and those same one, it was to the Home Depot Corporate Center. And it appeared that this phone number went through, and on his records it said six minutes worth the conversation. Were you able to track back to what, where that would have gone to, this call to the Home Depot Center? We did. Okay, and where would that have been? It went back to Toddler Room 5 at Little Aprons Academy, where Cooper attended school. So you have phone records suggesting he was on the phone for five or six minutes. Correct. You have the officers stating that he was actually talking to somebody on the phone. Correct. Did you confront him with this when he said that he was not talking to anybody? I did. And what did he say? He said he wasn't talking to anybody on the phone. Okay, let's talk about, when, did you ask the defendant how this could have occurred? Yes, I did. What did he say? The defendant thought um, his excuse was he fell asleep. Let's talk about that a second. First of all, you stated that at Chick-fil-A, um, he was active, talking, walking, waving to people. Did the defendant tell you how he secured the child back into that car seat and what happened when he did that at the Chick-fil-A? He did. Um, Justin took Cooper out to the car. Um, he went into the back seat where the car seat was um, situated. 
Um, it's a rear facing car seat, so Cooper's head would be in between or almost in between the two front seats. He put Cooper in the vehicle. Um, he stated he strapped him in tight. Um, he went through a little spiel about how he had watched YouTube videos about you know, car seat regulations and stuff, and he knew that this was the right car seat and the right way of doing it, and he straps him in tight. And um, Cooper gives him a kiss, and he gives him a kiss back, and he says he always gives him a kiss in case they get into a car accident and he dies. Um, he wanted Cooper to, you know, his last memory, or Cooper to remember that he had been loved or that his daddy loved him. So he straps him in before driving away, and they're having, they're, he's kissing him, son's mm -hmm. kissing him back, and they're having a conversation. That's correct. Now, you talked about this U-turn and then going to a light where you make a decision to either go to work or turn to the daycare. Yes, sir. Okay. The U-turn, about how far is it to get from the Chick-fil-A to this U-turn? Uh, seconds. When you get to this U-turn, what direction would he have had to turn to see uh, the oncoming traffic and then make the, the U-turn? It's a left-hand U-turn. He would have had to look to his right. And what is to his right? It would have been the car seat, which is visible in between the two seats. And I know we're in a, a probable cause hearing. Did you take photographs in this case? Hundreds. Okay. Uh, I'm just going to show you two. Do you think they would help uh, Judge Cox? I guess I do. Okay. I'll show you what I've already marked for identification purposes and shown to defense counsel, states exhibits one and two. May I approach Judge? Yes, sir. Thank you. You recognize states exhibits one and two? Yeah. These are photos from, it appears, from the car um, from the crime scene at Acres Mill. Okay. And do those fairly and accurately represent the car and the car seat as viewed at the scene where the car was left. Oh, they do. Your Honor, I would tender states exhibits one and two. No objection. It may be without objection. Um, first, before publishing uh, states exhibit one to the judge, we explain, can you actually see from outside the car looking through the window the car seat before you even get into the car? You can. Okay, and states exhibit two, does that look like where the car seat is in proximity to the driver in that car? Yes, it does. And is that consistent with your description of inches? Yes. You can publish those to the judge. Thank you. <coughs> From the time he left the Chick-fil-A to that light where he had to make that decision, have you driven that distance? I have. How many times? Mm, ten at least. How long does it take to get from having left the Chick-fil-A parking lot to that light? In 30 to 40 seconds. So 30 to 40 seconds from the time he has strapped his child in, kissed him, and then he says, for God. Correct. Now, the defendant, you said, stated that he must have fallen asleep. Did you speak with daycare workers about how the child acted on days he went to Chick-fil-A with his father before he came to daycare? I did. How did the daycare workers describe his behavior when he would go to Chick-fil-A? When they go to Chick-fil-A, um, Cooper would walk in, he'd be awake, um, walking in. Um, he just spent some time with his dad, he'd be happy. Now, the time it takes, how long would it take, and they said 30 minutes to that, or 30 seconds to that stoplight, how long would it take to get to the spot where he actually parked? From the light to there, um, less than two minutes. Now, when you talk to the defendant about what he did that day, did you talk to him about what he did while he was driving the car to work from Chick-fil-A and then when he parked? What he was doing? I did. And did he say he was doing anything out of the ordinary? No. And we asked him, were you on the cell phone? Were you talking to somebody? Were you on the computer? Was there any other distractions? And he stated no. When he parked, how did he park? Did he pull straight into a space or something else? When he pulls from the parking lot, he pulls past the space. Um, after he pulls past the space, he goes into reverse. Um, and he backs up, and when he backs up, he backs up in between two cars that were parked in the road behind him. Mm -hmm. And then he pulls forward into the parking space. And the parking space he pulls into, um, what is to the left? If, if I am the person driving the car, what is to my left? If you're the person driving the car, to your left is another car. And where is the driver's side on the other side of the defendant's car? No, the driver's, the driver's side, if you turn to your left, you're going to have a parked car, mm -hmm. and then defendant's car and then to the right is a grassy area okay so the right is actually a grassy area with no cars or anything correct okay now did his car have a 
backing camera or anything like that that would have assisted him when he stops, pulls back, and backs up to pull in. And nothing that I could get to turn on. So what would he have had to done to back up? He would have had to look either in the rearview mirror and use both his side mirrors. Now, you stated that he said he wasn't on the phone or anything like that when he parked. When he got out, when he parked the car, did he immediately get out? No, he did not. Did he take anything to work with him that day? Yes, he did. What did he take with him to work? He had a large computer bag. Did he tell you where and where he reached to get that bag? The large computer bag sits in front of the passenger seat in Which the front seat? of the car. Okay. Which way would he have had to turn to pick that up? He would have had to turn to his right, lean over to the center console, and pick up the computer bag from the right side of the car. And what would have been right there? It would have been um, Cooper's car seat. Now, you're talking about, we've seen the pictures of Cooper's car seat. Um, I guess you, you know the, how tall, how long Cooper was at the time of death. Yes. Uh, did you actually get some type of demonstrative aid to help you and law enforcement see how a child would fit into that car seat? We did. Um, how would Cooper's head have appeared in that car seat? The mannequin we chose was, you know, the same size. The head was clearly visible um, poking up over the car seat. Okay. And did that demonstrative aid, was that actually a little bit shorter than Cooper? Yes. Did it have hair like Cooper had? No. And after he got his laptop bag, now did the defendant immediately get out of the car? He did not. So after he parts, how long does the defendant sit in his car before he actually exits to go in the building? It's around 30 seconds from the time he parks the vehicle till the time he gets out and shuts the door. So he's sitting in there 30 seconds? Yes, sir. Now you talked about the defendant talking about his car seat and how it was too regular, I guess it was the correct one, uh, height, weight, things like mm -hmm. that. Uh, have you actually looked into this car seat and looked at the owner's manual? I have. Okay. Is he within the requirements or did Cooper exceed the requirements of that car seat? He exceeded the requirements by several inches. Now, he talked about his day. Um, did the defendant talk to you about what he did for lunch that day? He did. What did he tell you he had done for lunch that day? He got picked up by two of his friends for lunch. Um, they picked him up, they went to lunch, went to Publix to eat, um, ate at the hot bar, went to the UPS store, mm -hmm. and uh, then came back. Did he say about what time he got back or was he able to give you a definite time? He said they left about 12.30 and got back. Well, actually, they left like 11.30, got back around 12.30. Now, while you're talking to the defendant, he, does he obviously know why he's there? Yes. You've already talked to him about the fact that his child had been left in the car, and that's what he's talking to you about. Correct. At any time, did he ever mention to you that he had returned to that car during the day? No, sir. Did you find that he had? Yes, I did. How did you determine that? We pulled surveillance video for the entire day um, that the car was parked in the parking lot. And upon reviewing the surveillance video, around 12.42, um, we see a green car pull up in front of Justin's car. Um, now, let me stop you there. Did you eventually find out where he had gone during lunch that he had left out? Yes, sir. Where had he gone? He had gone to Publix. They had gone to the UPS store. And then they had gone to the Home Depot. Why had they gone to Home Depot? And they had gone to the Home Depot, and he had purchased um, two bags or two boxes of light bulbs. So when he comes back to the car, what does he do? Well, first of all, the, you said a car pulls up. What a happens? car pulls up, um, and from interviewing the two friends he went to lunch with, um, he, they pull up, he gets out of the car, they immediately take off. Um, you can see him walk up to the car, he approaches the car from the driver's side, approaches his car, opens up the driver's side door, and he kind of tosses the, um, the light bulbs inside. He's all the way inside the frame, but he just kind of tosses the light bulbs inside the car. Does he approach from the rear or from the front? He approaches from the left-hand side, from kind of an angle, Judge. Is that angle consistent with that photograph that the judge has? It is. Where he can see the car seat? Correct. That calls for speculation, objectively. I just asked if it's consistent, Judge. Overall. When he approaches, does it appear, is this video, can you describe to the, ju the judge how it appears he reaches in and where his head is? When he reaches in, he comes up, he opens up the door, and as he's reaching in, he kind of turns his head a little bit. 
home. He's in there, he has a clear view, and he kind of turns his head and then just tosses the light bulbs into the car. After he does that, does he hang out at the car very long or anything of that nature? No. What does he do? He shuts the door, um, turns around, and immediately starts walking into the Home Depot. At some point as he's walking back away from that car, does anyone else walk by him, and how does he react? Yeah, it appears another, we'll say that's another person, um, passes him walking towards his car as he's walking away from his car. As that person approaches him, he stops. Um, he kind of stands there for a little bit as the guy walks past him. You can see that man walk up towards his car. He starts a little bit. Justin starts a little bit. He stops. The guy walks past the car, and then Justin gets on the phone and goes inside the Home Depot. Now, during this day, additionally, did the defendant get any emails or anything from the daycare? Yes. Um, he received a group email um, from the, his teacher, um, Cooper's teacher, um, Michelle Gray, and that email came in around 13th, or actually 1.30 p.m. Let's talk a little bit about the movies. You said he, he was going to the movies, and his coworkers corroborated that, right? Yes. Okay, what time was the movie they were going to see? Five o'clock. What did you pull his, do you have the defendant's phone records and logs and things of that nature? We did. Okay. From looking at his phone uh, log, well, first of all, let me ask you this. Do you have the phone records from his provider or anything of that nature yet? We do not. Okay. And when do you, add, how long do you think it'll be before you get those? 18 T could be six weeks or more. But you've been able to look at his phone? Correct. Looking at his phone, um, were you, uh, did you see any phone calls? Yes. Okay. Who are the phone calls uh, between and what time? Approximately. He made, are, are we talking about the phone calls made that afternoon, or there's no phone calls made during the day? Okay. Just approaching 4 o'clock were there phone calls between the defendant and his wife? Yes. Okay. Tell the judge a little bit about that. Around 4 o'clock, he receives a phone call from his wife, Leanna. Um, they kind of play phone tag a little bit. He receives one, misses it, he calls her back, and then he calls her like a third time and actually gets through to her. And they have about a minute, um, a little over a minute phone call, phone and conversation. And was that phone call that they actually had the conversation with, was that at 404? Yes, it was. Now, did the defendant ever mention anything about getting texts from his wife that afternoon as well? No. Did his phone reflect anything about texts from his wife? No. Okay. The tickets to this 5 o'clock movie, did they, were they going to have to purchase tickets when they got there, or had they already been purchased? No. Um, one of his friends owed him a little bit of money, um, stated that he already bought his ticket, and that he knew about uh, Justin, I'm sorry, knew about it. At any point during the afternoon, uh, did he talk to one of his coworkers about when he was going to arrive at the movie theater? Around 3.45, um, he does contact through, a, it's like an inner office or IM, a, it could possibly be Google chat, but... They're, they're sitting there chatting back and forth, and around 3.45, he let them know he was going to be late to the movie. So he said he was going to be late to the movie? Correct. So after 5 o'clock? Correct. Was that in any way different from what the defendant told you in his statement? Yes. What did the defendant tell you about uh, going to the movies and whether he was going to be early or late? The defendant stated that he had left early. Um, he had left work early to get to the movies and, and beat the after-work rush. What time did he actually leave work again? He left work at about 4.16 p.m. How long does it take to get to the movie theater from there? Less than 10 minutes. And was this immediately after having had that phone conversation with his wife? Within nine minutes or so? Within nine minutes or so. So he tells co-worker he's going to be late, tells you he wanted to leave to be early. This was a Wednesday afternoon? It was. Okay. Let's talk about uh, his demeanor during his interview with you. Um, could you tell the judge a little bit about his demeanor and whether it seemed uh, odd to you in any way? His demeanor would, would, would actually would fluctuate also. Um, he started off trying to work himself up, and we're watching him on the camera as he's doing this, and he's walking around and he's rubbing his eyes, and he's, you know, trying to, it looked like he's trying to hyperventilate himself, and then he'll just stop. Um, he'll stop, he walked over, he sat and he looked through, we had a map on the wall that's covering up a two-way mirror, and he sits there and he looks at the map. Um, he sit up, he'll stand down, you know, sit back down. Um, no tears, no, you know, real emotion coming out of him except for, you know, the huffing, I would put it. 
During the, when you talked to him, did he give you any background as he used to work in law enforcement? Yes, he did. Tell the judge about that and have you determined exactly what it was he did? We, we've received two stories now. We received a story that he worked as a jailer and we received a story um, that he worked as a dispatcher. Um, in his own words to me on the interview, he worked for five years as a dispatcher down in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. When he spoke with you, did he do... I, I don't want you to take offense at this, but did he use cop language with you? He did. How so? He would talk when he sat there and he spoke with me. He would sit there and, and he would say, you know, like Alpha Bravo, everything would be spelled out of phonetics. And through the time you're talking with him about his son and his son's death, did you ever see any tears coming from him? No. Let's talk a little bit about his wife and the statements that she gave. Um, when. I assume she was supposed to show up at the daycare to pick up Cooper, correct? Correct. What time did she actually show up there? She showed up around about 4.51. When she showed up, according to witnesses at the daycare, did she make any uh, comments that were seemed out of the ordinary? She did. Once she walked into the daycare, she walked back to um, Cooper's classroom where she ran into um, Michelle, and she asked, you know, uh, why are you doing here? And Leanne's like, well, I'm here to pick up Cooper. And like Ross never dropped Cooper off and she's like just got really calm she's like well I don't know what to do they walk back out into the lobby and in front of several witnesses all of a sudden she states um, Ross must have left him in the car and and they're like what there, there's no other no other reason it he, Ross must have no other explanation excuse me Ross must have left him in the car and they try to console her, and they're like, no, you know, there's a thousand reasons. There, you know, he could have taken him to lunch or something. We, we don't know yet. And she's like, no. Eventually, did she speak with law enforcement back at the treehouse, the place where the defendant worked? She did. Okay. Um, when police spoke with her there, did they say anything of note about her reaction at the scene? Her reaction at the scene, um, she, she didn't show any emotion when they asked her, or actually when they notified her of Cooper's death. Um, she did make a statement that, you know, this was her worst nightmare. And after being told that he was deceased, did she ask to see her son or anything like that? No. Who did she ask to see? She asked to see her husband. Did officers witness a phone call from her mother to her? Yes, they did. Her being Leanne? Yes. And what did they uh, describe happened during this conversation? The officer stated that while they were sitting there talking to Leanne, she either received or made a phone call from her mom. And um, she described it as, or the officer's detectives, I'm sorry, described it as um, she, she just started screaming. And she's like, what do you mean Cooper's no longer here? What do you mean? And during this conversation, with all this emotion coming out, she's asked Leanne, they can and the emotion, hear this. Who's the emotion coming from? The emotion's coming from her mom, or who she identified as her mom. And, and during this, she's like, why aren't you crying? Why aren't you reacting to this? And what did Leanne say? She said, I must be in shock. How were they hearing the other in the conversation? It, it was so loud, Judge. Um, it's such an outburst, outburst I, I would put it. At some point after, did they bring uh, Leanna back and interview her as well? Yes, they did. And did they note the same lack of emotion from her when they were talking? That's correct. Now, did you finally see, did, did you see emotion from the defendant at some point? Yes. Okay. And at some point, did you put the defendant and his wife in a room together? I did. When you did that, um, who was it that got emotional? The father. And could you tell the judge, what was he being emotional about? What was the main thing he was crying about or, or, or sobbing about or whatever he was doing? Oh, it, it was all about him. Um, I can't believe this is happening to me. I can't believe you know this happened to me. Why am I being punished for this? Um, and it continued. It was all very one-sided. Did he talk about losing his job? He talked about losing his job. What are we going to do? I'm going to lose my job. I'll be charged with a felony. Did his wife ever say anything to him about what he said to police? And she asked him, um, she had him sit down, and he starts going through this, and she looks at him, she's like, well, did you say too much? At some point during this conversation, did the defendant try to describe to Leanna how Cooper looked when he pulled him out of that car? He did. Um, he, as they're sitting there talking and they're, they're, they're sitting there face to face and they were, they're left alone in the interview room and he, and he looks at her and he's like, he looked peaceful. 
did he describe the mouth and eyes of this child? He, he said Cooper's eyes were closed, um, his mouth was closed, and he just looked peaceful laying there. Now, at the scene, did you and other witnesses see the child that was laying there on the pavement? I did not witness Cooper on the scene. Um, I, I have, have you seen the photographs? I, I've seen the photographs, and I was present during Cooper's autopsy, yes. And did the other officers describe how he looked on the scene? Yes, they did. Were his eyes closed? They are not closed. Was his mouth closed? It was not closed. And in describing how Cooper looked to, his, to Leanna, did the defendant say anything to you that brought concern? And, and once again, as, as we're watching their, their reunion, um, after he's talking about how Cooper looked peaceful and his eyes were closed and it, it just, you know, looked like he's sleeping, um, he, he goes, and uh, he goes, I dreaded how he would look. Dreaded past tense. As in past tense. Uh, kind of common sense, detective, but are some of these things you've learned from going back and watching things again as this investigation is developed? That's correct. So I guess you found evidence since the arrest to further your investigation, mm -hmm. to kind of further your opinion on this case, correct? Mm -hmm. That's correct. Now, the de defendant, how did he say that he first noticed Cooper was in the car? The, the first time the defendant noticed Cooper as he was driving down the road, um, he went to make a lane change and he looked to his right as he was changing lanes and that's when he noticed that Cooper was laying back there. And this was as he was driving to um, the movie theater. And did he say that he drove further or he immediately pulled over? He drove a little bit further and then immediately pulled over. Now during the day, based on the descriptions he gave and the paths he traveled by the, uh, I guess, video evidence and things of that nature, would there have been other times that he would have also turned that direction during the day when he was driving that car? That's correct. Tell the judge a little bit about when he left work that day at 4.16, uh, 4.15, I guess, 10 minutes after he got off the phone with his wife. Did he get back out to his car and linger, or how did he leave? How fast did he leave? No, he was in the car mere seconds. Um, he didn't take time to roll down a window or do anything along that line. In the car mere seconds, and the car rolls off. How hot was it that day? Um, I believe generally. Was, generally like 88 degrees, I believe, at that time. And it had been a hot day during the entire day? Yes, sir. And he, sta he stated that as he pulled up, he, he kept the windows up. Correct. How long did it take from the time he closed the door to that car starting to roll? A seconds. So the door closes, he gets in, puts the key in, turns the ignition, starts it up, and drives off in two seconds. That's correct. Have you spoken, did you speak with Lieutenant Farrell in this case? I did. Lieutenant Farrell, uh, what's his job? Lieutenant Farrell's my um, immediate supervisor, um, unit commander. Now, did he approach the car at any point at the scene? He did. Um, about how long after the defendant had pulled over? Over an hour. And when he approached the car and stuck his head in, did he stick his head in? He did. When he did that, did, was there anything of note that he noticed an hour and 20 minutes after with the door open? Yeah, there was a foul order or, or stench coming from the vehicle. Now, did you actually access that vehicle later as well? I did. And why did you do that? We executed a search warrant on that vehicle later on that night. When you executed that search warrant and you went inside that vehicle hours later, did you notice anything? Yeah, it, it smelled like it was a foul order. Um, it smelled like decomposition or death. Now, just to, to prove the elements of this crime show, uh, did you speak with the Emmy about whether this child would have suffered cruel or excessive physical pain? We did. Okay. Uh, what did he say? Would it have been a painful death? Yes. Did you notice any, were there any injuries to the child's face? There were. And what were those? The way it's explained, um, there were several marks on the child's face. Um, it would have come from the child or a scratch being made while the child was alive and then not healing, um, not scabbing odor over or anything like that and just um, soon after he passed away. Were there any injuries to the child back of the child's head? Yes, there were um, abrasions to the back of the child's head. I'm going to turn your attention and talk a little bit about um, motive and intent in this case and about evidence you may have uncovered regarding that. Um, first, talking about negligence and motive. Um, specifically on the day of the incident, on uh, June the 18th, 2014, in reviewing the computers and phones and things like that of the defendants, 
did you uh, uncover anything and what he was doing during that day while his child was out in the car? Yes. Okay. What did you uncover? He was having um, up to six different um, conversations with um, different women, it appeared, from the, from the messages from Kick mostly, which is a messaging service. And is that a computer-related messaging service? It is. And these conversations he was having with these females, were these, what, of what nature were they? Uh, the most common term would be sexting. Um, were photos being sent back and forth between these women and the defendant during this day while the child's out in the car? Yes, there were photos of um, his exposed penis, um, erect penis being sent. Um, there were also photos of women's breasts being sent back to him. Now, did you actually, have you located every one of these girls that he's had contact with? I have not. Have you lo located any of them? I've located two of them. Okay. Um, the first one, um, I won't use the username, um, but I guess, let me, for lack of a better term, the older one. Mm -hmm. Did you speak with her? I did. And what did she say? She said that she had first met um, Ross, and she knew him as Ross, through um, Scout, which is another messaging service, and that he had met up and um, that he wanted to hook up with her. And did she talk to you and confirm the nature of what you saw on these, these chats back and forth? Yes, she did. Okay. Now, I'm going to turn your attention. Was there also another girl that you met and that you've spoken with? I have. And how old is that girl? She is 17 this time. How old was she when the defendant began these? Judge, I, I'm going to object. I mean, I'll let a little bit of this go, but um, I don't see how this has anything to do with anything. Your Honor, this is, if this is something that's going on during the during the middle of the day, um, I, I don't think it's relevant. What would be relevant would be the time period when the child was initially left in the car. Your Honor, this goes to negligence through the day, what he's doing through the day instead of worrying about his kid. It also goes to motive and marital problems between he and his wife and his unhappiness. I, I'm unclear as, as to, to the time frame. Do you have yes. a, uh, you I'll have clear it up. Okay. And so these these messages and these chats did they start in the morning they do okay and did they continue throughout the day they do and when did they end around three o'clock that afternoon okay. so about an hour before he left over with the objection okay. now this 16 year old girl with these chats of the or now 17 they started when she was 16 correct did these were these sexually involved as well they were Okay. Did she send him a picture that day? She did. Of what? She sent a picture of her exposed breasts. And did he send any pictures to her? He did. He sent a picture of his exposed erect penis. Now, we talked a little bit about these computers. Have you guys done examinations on these computers? We have. Are you finished with your examination of these computers? No, we've only scratched the surface. Now, based upon your review of these computers and other devices that he's had contact with, um, is it obvious that he has deleted some of the things from, from cross-referencing these computers and phones and items? Yes. Now I'm going to turn your attention again, like I said, motive uh, as to his marital status issues he's having in his state of mind. Did the wife tell you anything they were having any problems in their marriage? Um, Leanna stated that they're having intimacy problems. Mm -hmm. Going back um, to show how far this has been in his mind and the, the relationship between the two of them, um, did some messages with even different girls from back in 2013 uh, confirm that he'd been... Judge, I, I'm going to object again. I mean, if this is being offered somehow to prove motive, um, I, I don't know what in the world something back in 2013 has got, got to do with this at all. There's, there's been no connection whatsoever uh, between the events of that day and the death of this child and this fantasy texting or whatever it is. There's no, no connection at all. Judge, repeat your question. Okay, uh, in specifically to the motive or issue of having marital uh, let, problems. Let me, let me hear the question. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, did he have chats regarding um, uh, sexual activities with other women while his wife is sleeping and while his child was in the room somewhere? Well, again, what time frame were we doing? Oh, I'm with? sorry. This would have been back around 2013, leading up to 2014 when this happened. It's an ongoing activity of the marital issues, Judge. So your contention is that proves motive how? It mo proves motive because he was unhappy in his marriage. We plan to show that he wanted to live a child-free life or there's evidence to suggest that based on his internet searches. Well, I I'm still going to object, Judge, if, um, if you're unhappy in your marriage, you get a divorce. Um, this is, we're a long, long way from having uh, some sort of fantasy texting situation to, to uh, 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 the death of a child. 
There's no connection there at all. So, I, so I'm going to object to this. It's just not relevant. Judge well, well, this Sorry. is a probable cause hearing, and there's no jury, and uh, the court will uh, consider the evidence for whatever weight and value it should be given in the court's determination of probable cause. So overrule the objection. And I'll just speed this along. Um, did Were there sex and texts and messages talking about the fact that his wife knew he had cheated on her before? Yes, there were. Okay. And let's talk about and move up to about two weeks before the child's death. Um, with one of these people he was having a conversation with, um, did he talk about exposing himself uh, while he's chatting and messaging this girl? Yes. And was he sending pictures? Yes. And did he admit to her that he was not alone while he was doing it? Yes. And what was Judge, his quote? Listen, I'm, we're getting so far afield from the events of June the 18th. This has got nothing to do with those events whatsoever. The, the, stat, the status of his marriage and his fantasy life has got nothing to do with the events of June the 18th. We're, we're, we're just getting so far afield, Judge. This isn't relevant to anything. Judge, this goes to his state of mind in the two weeks leading up to the death of this child. So this occurred within two weeks? Yes, Your Honor. Overall, the objection. When she talked about him exposing himself to her on that and there's being somebody else there, what did he say? Who? who? So she, I, I'm just going to object. I, okay. What are we talking about? Who this other person that he is messaging with. Is it one of the two we know about? It's several other girls, Judge. Oh. This is a different one. Thank you. Did, did Overrule the objection. Yes, sir. Mm. We don't even know if it's a girl. Did, 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 if it's just some person, if we identified them? Well, would it be less relevant if it were a man? <laughs> I'll get back to you on that, Judge. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, from looking at the contacts, Detective, did you confirm via picture and name, and was this a female? The profile that she put online was that she was a female. And in addition to that, we talked about fantasy and things like that. Did you confirm through text and things like that that this was more than fantasy and that he'd actually met up for things? Yes. And one of those occasions at Rope Mill Park in Cherokee County? That is correct. Judge, again, I mean, I don't even know where to go from this. What in the world is something that he's met up with somebody, whether he has or not, last month, last year? What in the world has that got to do with the events of June 13th? Well, 18th. As, as Mr. Bourne has explained repeatedly, it's, it's uh, uh, what he sub contends is evidence of a motive. However, I think you have uh, uh, beat the horse to death, Mr. Bourne. If you'll move on to uh, uh, facts of the case. Thank you. And, Your Honor, may I take one more shot at the horse just to explain his state of mind one day later? It's not to do with the sexting. Is it the final question on this topic? It is. Okay. Uh, Detective, in that same, on the 5th of June, um, he talks about being a guitar player with this girl. Um, she asked him uh, about cheating on his wife. Did she ask him a, con a question about his conscience? She did. What did she ask him? She no, asked, she, she's who? She's this other girl he is sexting with. Thank you. And she does. Uh, injection. That's Same no response. way relevant to anything. Final question, he says, Mr. Kilgore. I'm going to allow a question and answer, and then we're moving on. She says something to the effect of, do you have a conscience? And what was his response? Nope. Now, again, talking about the marital problems and I guess Mr. Uh, Harris's state of mind, did uh, you learn information from talking to him and from these chats about his, how did his job was going leading up to the date of death? Yes. Okay. Where did he work? He worked at the Home Depot. Okay. Now, from looking at these chats and uh, emails and things like that with his wife, did you learn that he was unhappy at work? Yes. Had he been passed over for promotion? He had. Was that April of 2014? That is correct. Going to May of 2014, did you learn that he actually interviewed with Chick-fil-A corporate? That is correct. And did he get that job or not? He did not. And was he depressed? Yes. Um, did they have life insurance on Cooper? They did. What type of policy? They had two policies on Cooper. Um, the first policy was the $2,000 policy through the Home Depot. Um, now, the second one, was this something that they got back in 2013? Yes. Yeah, well, yeah, November 2012 is when he signed up for it. Okay. And was this something that he still had at the time of the child's death? That is correct. And how much was the policy? It was a $25,000 policy. Now, in speaking with him and from looking through the uh, text messages and chats with his wife and things like that, were they having any type of financial difficulty? They were. 
what type? She was complaining about his purchasing, um, sporadic purchasing or overcharging the credit cards. Now, who was in control of the finances at this time? He was. Did he tell you anything about his finances? Yes. What did he tell you? He stated that the finances were fine, that they had recently charged up $4,000 on a credit card, um, and he had done that for the airline miles. In looking at these uh, phones and computers and things like that, were you able to examine any web searches that he may have done? I did. Okay, first of all, I'm going to turn your attention to the, I guess, site, website, Reddit, R-E-D-D-I-T, -E for the court reporter. What is Reddit? Reddit is a, it's an ent entertainment site, is, is how it builds itself. It's a social networking, um, news sharing, blogging type of site. And on that are things called subreddits within the Reddit website. They are. Subreddits are like a subculture or a specific, um, you know, like or, you know, for a person. Basically a topic. A topic would be a good way to put it. Were there any topics of concern, first of all, regarding death? Yes. Uh, did you tell the judge about that? Uh, he visited several sites um, and these subreddits, it was um, people who died. Um, and I, once again, it may not be the perfect, but it's like people who die and it shows videos of people dying. And it's in all sorts of ways from suicides to Iraq, um, executions, um, those type of videos. Now, anything in looking at these subreddits, turn your attention to less than two months before this child's death, did he go to any topics pertinent to this case and motive? And he what did. was in his mind? He did. Tell the judge about what subreddit he went to pertinent to that. He went to a subreddit that was called Child Free. And Child Free is a people who advocate living child free. Um, they advocate not having any more children and adding to the, uh, the biomass, I guess, is the best way they put it. And when he went to this subreddit, did he actually view and read articles, or did he access articles in that topic? He did. He, um, over four of them, four of four. Was there anything about prison or anything like that you noticed in the web searches? He did. He did also did a search, um, how to survive prison. A search to what? How to survive in prison. And specific, through your, through your conversation with uh, the defendant during his interview, um, did he talk to you and use legal uh, uh, terms and things of that nature? He did. Through your searches, uh, the, just this preliminary look at the, um, his web searches, did he research any statutes in the state of Georgia? He did. He, um, he typed in and asked for the age of consent for Georgia. When you were speaking with him, what did he talk to you and how did he speak about the charges once you told him he was being arrested first for the cruelty charge? When I first spoke him to the cruelty charge, um, he argued it and um, said it was an accident. Did you later inform him he was also being arrested for felony murder? I did. Um, after the decision was made, um, and looking at everything we had gathered to that point, um, we did decide to charge him with murder. I brought him back into the interview room and sat him down to explain the charge to him. When you told him what he was been char being charged with, what language did he use when responding to you? Um, he looked at me and said, um, but there's no malicious intent. No malicious intent. Now, during the interview, um, just a l the last few questions on the topic of probable cause, um, did he discuss the issue of being afraid of children, his child dying in a car? Yes. What did he tell you about that? He said it was a fear of his. And did he explain further things he did about this fear that he had? Yeah, he had researched and watched websites um, on this fear, um, two in particular. He First, had let me ask you, did he watch anything on television involving an advocate? Yes. Tell the judge about what he said with that. He watched a TV show where an advocate um, who had lost his child, um, and he's, Ross said, just like me, um, in a child heat-related death, and now this gentleman was advocating for a turnaround program. Um, he was very conscious of this because of this advocate and the turnaround program, and he said he practiced it often. And, it's, and I'm sorry, for turnaround program means actually turn around and make sure there are no children in the car with you. So he actually, he learned about how to do that. That is correct. And his claim was he didn't do it on that day even knowing that. Correct. Did he talk about anything else about a video? He did. And uh, let's just, what did he tell you at that point? Let's just talk about what he told you first. He told me that uh, we were talking about, of course, you know, about Cooper's death again. Mm -hmm. And he said that he had watched another video. 
And in this video... Um, was this based in the internet? And this is an internet-based internet video. And in this video, a vet um, got on there and told him about the heat-related deaths um, of animals mm -hmm. in cars and how you can't even, if you roll down the windows, that um, your animal could perish in the car. And did he give you another example of how he was aware of the dangers of leaving a living thing in a car? He did. He said when he was working for Tuscaloosa, um, a canine was left in one of the PD vehicles and died within 10 minutes. I'm going to turn your attention to this video. You talked about these web searches that you did, um, or you did the examination you did to look at his web searches. Um, did you find a web search on his work computer, the Lenovo, related to what he had described to you? I did. Did you actually find the video on there that he described to you? I did. Could you tell the judge in detail what this video depicts? The video, and I believe it's, um, I might get the name wrong, it's like Ernie Ward, and he is a veterinarian, and he's a very, he's an advocate for, of course, you know, animal care. And the veterinarian decides to do a demonstration um, about the dangers of leaving your animal in the car. So he goes out to a car, he sits in the car in the middle of the summer. Um, it appears to be very hot outside. Um, and he sits there for 30 minutes. And as he, the video is about six minutes long. And through this video, he's showing you times and he's showing you temperature. The temperature in the car gets to over 117 degrees, or around 117 degrees. And he starts to explain how horrible a feeling it is to be in this car. And he goes over it several times. He goes, this is horrible. He goes, imagine if you couldn't move. If I wasn't a thinking person, I could reason through this, that if they were just trapped here in this car. Now, this video, was it something that you, looking from your examination, that he had viewed once? No. How many times did he view it? He viewed it twice. And Detective... What day did he view this video last, according to the examination of that computer? Uh, according to our examination, he viewed it on June 13th, 2014. Five days before the child's death? That's correct. Judge, those are all the questions I have for probable cause. Um, do you want me to go ahead? I have some questions regarding bond with the detective. Should I go ahead now or reserve? Might as well. Okay. Thank you, Your Honor. Okay. Uh, first of all, on the issue of flight and whether the defendant would be a... a risk of flight. Um, do you have any concerns? Is there any evidence that you've learned through this case that he may be a risk of flight? I, I do. Um, I, I do believe he would be a risk for flight. Um, number one, he has already stated that he's got law enforcement experience in his own words. Um, secondly, he is a, um, well, was a resident most recently of Alabama. Um, during the interview, he stated he had no friends here and that his family, well, no, no, I'm sorry, had no family here. Um, his family is all in Alabama. Um, Evidence is showing us right now that he's got this whole second life that he's living with alternate personalities and alternate um, personas, um, which would also make him a flight risk and you know harder to you know keep track of or to locate if needed. Now, as far as contacting and intimidating witnesses, mm -hmm. um, do you have any concerns from your investigation about? whether that may pose a problem. Uh, I do. He, he is a computer expert. Um, all these people that he's been talking to, um, they've got catching names. I believe he would be able to find them again. Um, and since he has met them once, there's nothing stopping him, to, and not everyone, but, you know, that, mm -hmm. to meet them again. And based on the, I guess, the breadth of this investigation, have you ever been able to positively identify and speak with all of these witnesses yet? No. Now, based on his actions at the scene, we didn't talk about this so much. Um, when police officers approached the defendant, could you tell the judge about how he reacted? Well, when the officer approached, he was on the phone, and he was telling somebody that his child was dead. And they asked him to get off the phone, and he said no. And um, the officer asked him again to get off the phone, and um, he goes, fuck you. And so the officers were able to, well, at that time, took his phone away and uh, placed him in handcuffs and detained him at that time. And was he placed in the back of the, the patrol car? He was. And have you reviewed that video? I have. And does the defendant show any emotion or anything in the back of that patrol car while he's sitting there? No. Regarding calling 911, did he ever call 911 in this case? No, he did not. Finally, regarding the factor of whether he's a threat to commit other crimes, um, do you think that he may be a threat to commit other crimes? Yes. In addition just to the nature of this offense, um, 
based on these chats and things of these natures and messages and the pictures sent, have you determined that he has committed other crimes? Yes, I have. And generally, what crimes and what that what would that have involved? Right now, it's computer-based crimes, um, sexual sexual exploitation of a minor. And also, does it appear that he has uh, committed two misdemeanor violations involving illegal contact with a minor sexually? True. I believe that's all I have, Judge. Before you start, Mr. Kilgore, I have a question. The, yes, sir. The condition of the child's body when it was removed from the SUV. Yes, sir. Uh, can you give me more information? You yes, said sir. the child was deceased. The, what is that based on? The child, when he was removed from the um, removed from the car and placed down the ground, the, the child was in rigor mortis, um, according to the, <coughs> the medics on scene. Um, the head was kind of up. The feet were kind of cocked back. You could see lividity starting. Um, the child's eyes were half closed. The lips were discolored, and, and it appeared as if his tongue was protruding from his mouth. And did anybody give you any estimation of how long it would take for the body to be in that condition after death? According to, and once again, these are preliminary results coming from doctor from the medical examiner's office. Uh, he believes the child was dead before noon. All right. You may cross-examine, Mr. Kilburn. Thank you. Thank you, Sir, how are you? Good. Um, first of all, on the issue of um, on the issue of bond. Um, where exactly do you think Mr. Harris could go in the United States of America and somebody wouldn't recognize him? Um, several places. Like a cave or something? No, I think he'd walk down the street and you know, someone wouldn't recognize him. Have you have you seen the TVs lately or? Actually, I have not. No, sir, I have Newspapers? not. Newspapers? No. No. Okay. The um. The warrant that we're here on today, of course, charges um, uh, cruelty to uh, a child in the second degree as the underlying felony. Yes, sir. Um, so tell me exactly, uh, exactly when Ross uh, committed that particular offense. Well, he committed the offense of neglect by leaving his child in the car all day. Okay, so you're 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 telling us then that that act was completed at the time he left the child in the car and walked away? Correct. Um, the warrant doesn't allege that that act was intentional? Correct. Okay. And um, if it's not intentional, would you agree then that it would be unintentional? I think the evidence now is showing intent. Okay. The... Um, the arrest on the 18th. There was a, there was a first warrant which charged cruelty to a child in the first degree. Yes, sir. Okay. And then you took a second warrant five days later on. Well, five days later, the 24th. Yes, sir. Six days later or so. Five or six days. Yeah. Okay. Um, so at that time you had done five or six days of investigation. Yes, sir. Okay. And you then stepped the warrant back. To cruelty in the second degree. I would argue it's not a step back. Okay. Well, you went from basically an allegation of willful to negligence. Or yes, sir. Criminal negligence, right? That is correct. Right. Was there was there like one particular piece of evidence or so that caused you to, to make that change in the warrant? No, nah, there's multiple pieces of evidence. What was what would you say was the primary piece of evidence that caused you to to move from willfulness to, to negligence? The, the primary was is is how it's worded, and it was our the medical examiner's report came back, and he came back and said it was hyperthermia. Um, before we are going with dehydration, lack of sustenance, um, he came back stated that you know it was hyperthermia. The child did die from the neglect of being left in that car seat. And that was, that was why the decision was made to get a second warrant for second degree? Yes, sir. Now you are the case agent, right? That is correct. Okay, so you, you pretty much know everything 
all the information flows to and through you, right? We try. Okay. Well, you got computer crimes involved in this. You've got a lot of moving parts. They all report back to you. They all issue reports, yes, sir. Okay. And you keep up with that and you know what's going on. I try. All right, let's talk about the scene uh, for a moment. At the scene, you, did you personally ever go to the scene? I did. All right. And at what time did you get there? I got there about 5.07 p.m. Okay. And what was going on at the scene when you got there? When I got to the scene, um, the scene had been secured. Um, detectives were walking in the scene, getting their cursory views. Crime scene was on scene, um, starting their photographs. Okay. And did you talk to the officers at the scene? I did. Who, who were the officers at the scene? I spoke with Officer Piper and Officer Foglia. Piper and who? Foglia. Foglia? Yes, sir. Okay. And had those officers interviewed witnesses at the scene? They had. Do you know who they interviewed? I do not. Okay. Did you interview witnesses at the scene? I did not. Do you know if there was any detective that interviewed witnesses at the scene? Yes. Who was that? Detective Racy was on scene. Detective Murphy was on scene. Did you say Racy? Racy. How do you spell that? R-A-I-S-S-I. Okay. And Detective Murphy. And Detective Murphy. And I believe both of them um, interviewed witnesses. Okay. Do you have a list of those who were interviewed? I do. All right. Can you tell me who those folks were? I cannot. How many were interviewed? Multiple. They didn't all give exactly the same story, did they? No, sir. In fact, you interviewed several witnesses who told you that Mr. Harris was absolutely hysterical at that scene. I didn't interview anybody at that scene. Some of your detectives interviewed witnesses who told you or told them mm -hmm. that Mr. Harris was absolutely hysterical. I'd say that's true. There were witnesses who told some of your detectives that he was crying at the scene. Mm, I don't recall anybody saying he was crying. Screaming. I go screaming. In shock. I don't recall those words being used. Okay. Dazed. I'll go dazed. Okay. And did you record all those interviews? I did not. Well, when I say you, I'm talking about the Cobb County Police Department. Well, I know I know you didn't you do it all. You need to be more specific in your question. Did your detectives record those interviews? Yes, sir, they did. Okay. All right, and did your detectives get the names of the uh, the EMTs there as well? They did, sir. Okay. Of the, um, of the uh, witnesses that were there on the scene, isn't it true that some of them actually reported seeing uh, Mr. Harris down on the ground trying to give CPR to Cooper? Yes, sir. Okay. And then there were some who didn't see that. That's correct. So there were... Stories really were kind of all over the place, weren't they? Yes. Okay. But but they all agreed that it was absolute chaos, didn't they? I wouldn't use those words, but... <clears throat> Do you remember if you inter if uh, one of your detectives interviewed a witness by the name of Leonard Madden, M-A-D-D-E-N? I do not know, sir. You have no idea what Mr. Madden would have seen if he was there? No, sir. Okay. You told us that um, Ross used uh, profanity at one of the officers. Um, How did you get that information? Uh, three different ways. Um, number one, the officer told me. Mm -hmm. and number two, it was recorded on um, video. Mm -hmm. um, a video, I don't remember which one. Um, can hear profanity, and then from Ross himself in the interview room. Right. And all the information you got um, was consistent that that occurred when Ross was trying to get over there uh, to Cooper, who was on the ground, and the officer was trying to keep him back. No. No? No. That's not what Ross told you? That's not what Ross told me. That's not what the witness told you? I didn't speak with the witnesses. Okay. I spoke with the officer. Officer stated he was on the phone when it happened. Okay. On the phone with who? We don't know. And she told him to get off the phone? She did. And this conversation between an officer and Mr. Harris would have been within what? Um, 
20 minutes of Mr. Harris discovering the body of his child? Oh, less than that. Less than that. Well, how quick, how quick did PD get to the scene? PD got to the scene, I believe it was 423 when the first units were arriving. Okay. So you would agree it's certainly not unusual for uh, someone who discovers uh, the body of their child in such a way very well could be in shock. Yes. Okay. Could be dazed. True. Could be showing a range of emotions from outrage to just blankness, correct? True. Okay. And that, that would be consistent with some of the information that you got, not you, that some of your detectives got from those witnesses that were at the scene. Yes, sir. Because he was all over the place. Yes, sir. You said that the uh, you've got a recording of Ross in the back of the cruiser. That's correct. Okay. Now, um, is it accurate that what you were told by your officers was Ross was actually handcuffed by two officers and put in the back of a cruiser, which was only about 100 feet away from where the body of his child was? That's true. And he sat in that cruiser in eye shot of his child under a blanket for what? 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour? I don't know if he had eye shot, sir. It was parked on the other side of his vehicle. Okay. How close? Within 100 feet? Within 100 feet. And you said you discovered that there were a couple of phone calls that were made. The last one being a six-minute call, you said that came back to Little Apron's daycare, right? Yes, sir. Have you spoken to anybody at Little Acres Daycare? Do you know who he was talking to? Not yet. Okay. In fact, do you know that he was talking to anybody? Well, it was a six-minute phone call. Um, they do not have a six-minute messaging system there. Um, so he was speaking, and it's an apparent he was speaking with somebody. Okay. And um, you learned during the interview that he was trying to reach Little Aprons before his wife got there to let them know, hey, keep her there. Because she's going to find out about this. That's correct. why he was trying to reach Little Aprons, right? That is correct. And that certainly would be consistent with someone who is in absolute panic at that time, correct? I would say it would be reasonable. Okay. When he was driven away from the scene in the cruiser, uh, was Ross taken directly to um, persons to be interviewed? Yes, sir. Right. When he got to Persons, how long was he there before he was interviewed? I don't have those times in front of me, sir. Well, was, do you think it was more than an hour? I would say less than an hour. Okay. And during the time he was there, he was in a cell, right? No. No? He was no. just in a lobby? He was unhandcuffed. He was placed into the interview room and okay. given water. Okay. And you recorded all of that? That's all recorded, sure. So anything he said or did regardless of how it may be characterized, we're going to get to see it at some point, right? Yes, sir. Okay. And then, um, who came in there to speak with him? I did. And Detective um, Waldorf. Who? Waldorf. Waldorf. With the Crimes Against Children's Unit. So by the time that you sat down to interview him, um, he had just seen the, um, the, the body of his son had been, at that juncture, less than three hours. Yes. Less than two hours. Um, we'll say less than three for now. Okay. Certainly a sufficiently short period of time where somebody absolutely could still be in shock, correct? Correct. And at this point in time, when you, when you spoke to him in that interview room, he had not had an opportunity to see his wife, speak to his wife, or have any interaction with her, with her at all, had he? That's correct. During the interview, was he expressing to you concerns about what in the world he was going to say to his wife? Yes. And he wanted to talk to her? Correct. And that would not be a remarkable or unusual concern for somebody in this situation, would it? I would say no. How long was the interview? believe the interview is about, and I'm going to say approximately, but around an hour, hour and a half. 
and it's audio and video? It is audio and video. Okay. So you went through the events of the day? That's correct. You didn't, um, you didn't discover that Ross had taken Cooper to Chick-fil-A? He told you that? Correct. He told you that uh, they went there, they went inside, they ordered breakfast, and they had breakfast there? Correct. And have you gone to Chick-fil-A to get a recording of those events? We have. Okay. And have you reviewed those yet? I have. Okay. And it's fair to say that what Ross told you about what transpired at Chick-fil-A, that was accurate? True. Who, um, who, who have you talked to at Chick-fil-A or who have some of the detectives talked to at Chick-fil-A? They talked to the manager. Do you know who that is? I don't. Well, it's the owner-operator, I'm sorry. It would be a more accurate way of putting it. I don't remember his name. Okay. And do they remember seeing Ross and Cooper in there that morning? They do. Okay. Did he tell you that Ross comes to Chick-fil-A a lot? Yes. And have you seen his debit card records yet? No, I have not. Okay. Did he tell you that Ross comes to Chick-fil-A a lot by himself? No. Did he tell you that Ross comes to Chick-fil-A and goes through the drive through a lot? No. Did he tell you that Ross comes to Chick-fil-A and goes through the drive through in the morning and gets breakfast a lot? No. If you looked at his, his swipe card, you might be able to, to determine that, right? Yes, sir. Okay. Did, um, did Ross, in fact, tell you that normally he takes Cooper to daycare, then he comes back to Chick-fil-A, gets his breakfast, and then goes to work? No, not normally. He said that occasionally he would. Occasionally? Occasionally. That's what he told you, that occasionally he would take Cooper to daycare, <coughs> then go to Chick-fil-A to get breakfast, <coughs> then go straight to work. Yes, sir. During this interview, he um, he told you that he drove straight to work? True. He told you that he forgot Cooper? True. He told you it was an accident? True. He told you that he parked in the parking lot. He told you about getting his briefcase out of the the uh, passenger seat and going into work. True. And you checked all that out. And that that was all accurate. It was all true. Correct. He told you that he went to lunch at Publix. Yes. Okay. In fact, he told you the, the names of the two friends that he went to Publix with, right? He did. And who were those two gentlemen? Alex Hall and Winston Millings. Told you that um, came back to work. Right? Yes. Did he tell you about going to Home Depot to get the light bulbs? No. Did you ever specifically ask him if he made any detours other than just going to lunch, coming back to the office? No, sir. So you agree it's certainly possible that he forgot going to Home Depot to get those light bulbs? No. You don't think it's possible? I don't think it's possible at all. You don't think that's what happened? You tell me you don't think it's possible at all that he could have forgotten he went to go get light bulbs? No, it's too many forgetful things in one day. Okay. Well, what is the um, what is the number of things that you can forget in a day and be okay? Is there a certain number? Um, I'm not. I won't give you a number. Sir. Is it six? I don't think there's any way he forgot going to the Home Depot. Okay. He was very specific. And let me explain. But he was very specific in what he had done that day. Everything was specific. Everything had a time. Everything was in line. Except he forgot his son, 
and he forgot that he went to Publix and that he visited his car at lunchtime. You remember going to Publix? He told you that. Oh, but he I'm sorry for going to Home Depot. Don't talk over each other. He forgot that, and I'm sorry. He forgot they had gone to Home Depot and picked up the light bulbs. So you now agree he did forget to tell you? <laughs> no, I don't agree at all. Okay. And. Um, he didn't uh, obviously didn't tell you that his two friends dropped him off at his car and he tossed the light bulbs into the, the car. He did not mention that. Okay. So it just so I understand what your position is on on this is. Um, it, are you suggesting then that he gives you the names of his two colleagues that? He went to Home Depot with and who dropped him off at his car. He gave you those names and yet he was going to intentionally not tell you about doing that. Yes, sir. That perhaps you just wouldn't talk to his colleagues or something. Uh, speculation. Yeah. And there's there's cameras all over that Home Depot parking lot, right? There are, sir. So if he, if he was going to intentionally not tell you that he had gone and tossed the light bulbs in the car, I, I, I mean, it's a pretty good reason to suspect he probably knew there's cameras in that parking lot, right? It calls for speculation, sir. Okay. Well, he worked there, what, two years? Two years. He, um, he told you that they had planned to see a movie during the day. After work. After work. But during the day, he and his colleagues talked about seeing a movie. That's correct. And you checked that out? We did. And that was true? Yes, it was. And in fact, you looked at the chat log between uh, Alex and Winston and Ross, and, and they talked about starting early in the morning. They talked about going to lunch. They talked about planning to go to a movie. Correct? I don't have the full chat log yet. Okay. Or if I have it, I've not found it. But you talked with Alex and Winston and checked that out, and sure enough, that was true. They were yes, planning sir. on going to a movie? They were. That's right. <clears throat> um, let, me, let me clarify one thing. Did, um, didn't, one of his, didn't one of his colleagues email you that chat log? One of the colleagues just announced a blurb of the chat log, and it's, it's not even really readable. Okay. So if, in fact, that chat log indicated that during the day, three of these gentlemen talked about <coughs> interns that were working there, um, which school had the most interns, uh, they were talking about going to lunch, talking about going to Publix, talking about going to a movie later in the day, that would be completely consistent with whatever Ross told you. <coughs> Except with the interns and, and the peripheral stuff, but... <coughs> So I'll say no. Did, uh, did Ross tell you that one of his colleagues was going to go buy the tickets ahead of time? True. Okay. And you checked that out, and that was true? Yes, it was. Okay. And it's true that, in fact, where he pulled over there off Acres Mill Road, that was on the way to the movie. Correct. And where his office is, he had to go that direction toward the movie. Correct. And when he pulled off, he had to take a right into the shopping center where Cinco is. Yes, sir. And his car literally was pulled in the middle of the road, wasn't it? That is correct. 